Good afternoon. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for bringing us um, here today. And uh, second, I only have 15 minutes, so this presentation is mostly thesis on a theme um, of the role of cinema in the role of the Soviet Union um, as terrains for 1968 protests. And if, I, if something seems out of context, I will be able um, to answer questions after. Uh, today, I will talk about two moments, the 1967 International Moscow Film Festival and 1975 UNESCO Symposium on Women in Cinema, and uh, two film directors who participated in each of these events, respectively, Senegalese Usman Semben and Ukrainian Larisa Shepitko. But first, it is important to understand that the international film scene uh, was an important part of 1968 protests. Um, in the 68 student and worker demonstrations in Europe revolutionized filmmakers as well, disrupting the three top film festivals that year. In France, uh, new wave directors Francois Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard led the revolt that suspended the Cannes Festival that year um, as representative of retrograde cinema papa and French state cultural diplomacy. Berlin and Venice festivals the same year were nearly um, cancelled as well. These upheavals gave rise to new programs at all three festivals that showcased the new national cinemas and um, experimental cinema by young filmmakers. In the Soviet Union, uh, the 68 is remembered differently. It is a year of invasion in, of Czechoslovakia that marked the end of the thaw, a brief period of democratization after Joseph, uh, Joseph Stalin's death. Um, that gave rise to the dissident new wave in Soviet cinema that included the work of Larissa Shepitko. But it also marks the first year of the Tashkent Festival for Asian and African Cinema um, in the Soviet Republic of Uzbekistan. Because the Tashkent Festival took place after the invasion, Western journalists boycotted the festival. But none of the African and Asian filmmakers canceled, including Usman Semben, who also came. They came because meeting other Asian and African artists and seeing their films was more important for them than European politics. The di uh, diversity of representation at the festival was unique at the time. 240 filmmakers from 49 African and Asian countries came. As an attendee from Guinea, Alfa Amadou Diallo pointed out, because of distribution um, and language issues, a Senegalese had to travel to Tashkent to see a film made in neighboring Guinea at the time. This history points to some of the disconnects in 1968 radical movements. European students, third world filmmakers, and Soviet dissidents shared the intense political commitment of the moment, but sometimes clashed in their understanding of core political goals and methods. I believe contemporary political movements suffer from the same issue as well. That's where Simben and Shepitko come in. Their international travels show how third and second world activists mobilized seemingly in irreconcilable variants of radicalism circulating around the 68 moments, in this case, post-colonial, feminist, and Soviet dissident politics. So I will begin with Semben. Senegalese filmmaker Usman Semben is often called the father of African cinema. He held a variety of occupations, including being a stevedore at, in Marseille before he became a respected novelist and then a filmmaker. He was briefly a member of the French Communist Party and also had a hand in most Pan-African and Third Cinema Institutional building during the 60s and 70s. He co-founded both the Pan-African Federation of Film Professionals and the African Film Festival in Ogadougou in 1969. Less known as Simban's ties to the Soviet Union. These ties went back to 1958 when he attended the Afro-Asian Writers' Congress at Tashkent. That when he decided to study filmmaking, he wrote to several countries asking for support, including Czechoslovakia and the United States, um, and the Soviet Union responded first. Semben spent 61-62 uh, studying with Mark Donskoy at the Gorky Film Studio in Moscow. Semben's films, many of them based on his own novels, used neorealist aesthetic to critique French colonialism and later post-independence Senegalese bureaucracy and economic and gender inequities. In his debut film, Black Girl, a young Senegalese woman um, goes to work for a French family in search of a better life, but receives nothing but confinement and cruelty that eventually lead to her uh, suicide. In his next feature, Mandabi, a satire of Senegalese bureaucracy, a man without an ID tries and fails to catch the money order that would save him from financial ruin. 
Black Girl received no distribution in France, and many, um, in, at least initially, and many of his subsequent films were banned in Senegal. But Simbin continued to make political films despite political censorship. Um, he died in 2007. At the same, and he continued to make films until then. At the same time, Simbin achieved recognition at uh, major film festivals right away. Black Girl, despite not being shown in France initially, won a number of prizes, including a first prize in the first Negro Arts Festival in Dakar and a Jean Vigo Prize at Cannes in 1966. Mandabi won a jury prize at Venice in 1968 and also played at the Tashkent Festival the same year. So naturally, Soviet functionaries took credit for the success. When Usman Simbens Black Girl won Grand Prix at the first Cartage Film Festival of Arab and African Cinema in 1966, Soviet representatives reported a victory for the USSR. A Soviet-trained African filmmaker would serve as figurehead for socialist cinema practices. Um, one of them wrote, he studied with Mark Daskoy, and it is great that we're inviting him to serve on the jury of the Moscow International Film Festival. His film um, fights against social inequality and oppression, and he will be great. When Simbin got to the Moscow Film Festival in 67 as a jury member for the short film competition, he did give interviews to, uh, to Soviet press and appeared at events. But he spent most of his time in meetings with African filmmakers to plan an African Filmmakers Congress. As the interpreter provided to Simbin by the festival described in her report, and this is a report, basically these people were spies for the KGB and they would follow the filmmakers and then report what the filmmakers did and who they met um, and what they said about the festival. Um, but this filmmaker liked uh, Simbin so much uh, that she called him uh, very interesting and brilliant and strongly requested to work with him in he, if he comes to the festival again. So she was sympathetic. She wrote, Simbin united all delegates from the Black Africa and led them in meetings where they drafted the statement and decided on the planning of their festival. Simbin was diplomatic and reticent about stating his opinion on African cinema and the Moscow festival with Soviet reporters, but lost his reserve when debating with his African colleagues. What this story shows is that it is, use, um, it is useless to treat African support and attendance at Soviet events as success for Soviet cultural diplomacy. Simbin's consistent attendance of Moscow and Tashkent festivals in the 60s and 70s have been downplayed um, in his recent bi uh, biographies as if this part of his life is an embarrassment that contradicts the African origin of his anti-colonial and anti-capitalist politics. So I forgot to show you. This is the report um, of the committee from the Tunis uh, festival about Simbin, and this is the spy report from the translator. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, as if this part of his life is an embarrassment that contradicts the African origins of his anti-colonial and anti-capitalist politics and his realist aesthetic. But if we consider Simbin's Soviet activities as a stage in his African organizing, it, it, it becomes important to bring it in. So now the case of Larissa Shapitko. Ukrainian director Larissa Shapitko is mo almost entirely forgotten now, in part because she only made five feature films before she died in a car accident in 1971. Um, 79. But she was once widely known as one of the brilliant dissident filmmakers of the 60s and 70s, part of the Soviet New Wave that also included Andrei Tarkovsky and Andron Konchalovsky. In Russia, Shipitko is mostly remembered as an uncom uncompromising dissident who insisted on always making films that spoke truth to power, despite possible censorship and blacklisting. This is something that she and Simbin had in common. As they did with many Tarkovsky films, Soviet censors blocked her Homeland of Electricity, a segment uh, made to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the October Revolution, from distribution. The censors considered the story of starving villagers banding together to advance socialism not optimistic enough. It recalled the brutal state-engineered famine of 1933 uh, in Ukraine and southern Russia. But in the West, Shepitko is remembered as a figure um, in women's cinema. In the 70s, with the rise of feminism, she became a woman filmmaker. Shepitko's work does not entirely fit that category. Her films examine strong protagonists, men in all, one, uh, all but one of her films, in moments of extreme moral and spiritual crisis. She tends to film in extreme weather conditions as well. She fell ill while making her gig diploma uh, film Heat in Kazakhstan during a heat wave in 1963. Oh, this is it. Um, and Vgeek is um, a film school in Moscow, the oldest film school in, in the world, in fact. 
about Wings, her one film that does have a, um, a woman pr a protagonist who is a war, a war veteran and a pilot, Russian director Mikhail Rom suggested that it showed a masculine touch. He meant it as a compliment. <laughs> Shepitka was recognized internationally right out of film school. Heat played at Karl Vivari Festival in Czechoslovakia in 1964 and Wings in Venice in 1972. When Shepitka was invited to the UNESCO Symposium on Women in Cinema, in, in 1975, in St. Vincent, Italy, she rose to the occasion. The symposium took place as a result of a um, UNESCO session entitled UNESCO Efforts Concerning the Improvement of the Status of Women, and brought together canonic European figures like Ag Agnes Varda, Chantal Ackermann, and, um, well, an American, Susan Sontag, as well as women filmmakers from countries like Egypt, India, and Ar Argentina. It was part of a spate of women's film festivals and retrospectives taking place in Europe and the United States at the time. At first, Shepitka was surprised that film were not the main part of the event, and that she was asked to make a speech about the state of women in Soviet cinema. She didn't know English well and had to speak through an interpreter. But like Simbana in the Soviet Union, she was able to adapt to her role as a feminist figure. Her notes convey what she said at the meeting. I am privileged in my country. That's what she said. But gender problems in filmmaking do not disappear. Women directors are just as few in Soviet cinema as in any other national cinema. So the gender problems remain as part of the basic nature of the profession. In, um, uh, later, she noted that it's difficult to re-educate men. While equality of women in employment and pay is guaranteed by Soviet law, when the man comes home, the old age prejudices remain. The symposium did not change the direction of Shepitska's work. She filmed her last film, The Ascent, about betrayal and sacrifice during World War II in freezing cold with a male protagonist. The Ascent won Silver Bear at Berlin in 1977 and went on to be shown at Telluride Film Festival and throughout the United States the same year. In these later travels in Europe and North America, she was able to present a different politics for her films. Her focus on the spiritual and the personal refused the official Soviet mandate for an artist to always express state political directives. Her beautiful visuals in black and white conveyed the link between the heightened states of nature and spirit. During the screening of the ascent at the Pacific Film Archive at the University of California, Berkeley, German director Werner Herzog argued that it was the cold that was the main character in the ascent. At the same time, Shepitko's experience at the UNESCO Symposium later helped her to articulate the relationship between her dissident and gender politics to her Soviet audiences. In her last interview in 1979, she responded to Rom's comment about her masculine touch. She said, I make my films as a woman, but there's real cinema and there's feminine dabbling. 90% of our cinema is feminine dabbling, and men are its main practitioners. Finally, it is important to understand the economics of cinema networks in, the, in this period, both for third and second world travelers. Recently, I asked the Sudanese filmmaker, a graduate of GIC, the, the, the film school uh, in Moscow, why he attended the Tashkent Festival in 1980 when he could instead go to a festival in Ogodugu or Tunis. He explained that those festivals showcased African cinema but did not pay for attendees and he just couldn't afford to go. But the cultural policy of the USSR included education at the Moscow Film Institute at Soviet expense, as well as invitations to Moscow and Tashkent film festivals fully funded by the Soviets for all non-Western participants and guests. That was invaluable for interaction among filmmakers from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Shepitka was in the same position of extreme poverty when she traveled in Europe and North America. When she went to Telluride Festival in 77, her allowance from the Soviet government was $5 a day less than the price of one American lunch. So she was entirely at the mercy of her very generous American hosts. Her participation at the Women in Cinema Symposium was funded by UNESCO. In different ways, Simbana and Shepitko critically negotiated their political roles assigned to them by states and political movements. Um, Simbana used the Soviet, um, his Soviet film training, connections, and financial support to further his pan-African organizing, and Shepitko deployed her Western label of a woman director to articulate Soviet dissident and gender politics to feminist and leftist radicals in Western Europe and North America. The gap in understanding of radicalism across social movements have persisted after the long 60s into today. Susan Bachmorse remembers the Perestroika era failed project to establish a common, um, a common critical discourse in collaboration with Soviet dissident philosophers. Several years of contact and debates culminated in the conference in Dubrovnik, Croatia. 
There, Bakmors completely lost her temper when, in the middle of her talk, a Georgian philosopher, Mirab Mamandashvili, took away her talk as if she was a child and proceeded to correct her mistaken opinions. Frederick Jameson left the conference early in frustration, concluding, there are really no common denominators in this initial struggle for discursive rules, and what we end up with is an inevitable comedy of each side muttering irrelevant replies in its own favorite language. Simbena and Shapitko give us a different view. Their two intersecting journeys allow us to imagine a common critical discourse that would take advantage of variants of radicalism across historical and contemporary West, post-Soviet East, and global South. Thank you.